Welcome to Grace City Church. We're so glad that you are here with us as we finish up our series, Frequently Asked Questions, based on the survey you filled out. And so today I wanted to wrap up our series by talking about the second most frequently asked question, and that is how do I find God's purpose for my life? And that is a fantastic question because the Bible says in Psalm 139 that before you were born, God wrote a book about your life. That book contains everything that God wants you to accomplish. It contains God's purpose for your life, that everyone has a book of destiny that is written out about all the things that God wants you to do, the difference that he wants you to make in the world, the unique impact he wants you to have on the lives of others. It is all written out in a book before you were born. But here's the thing. Just because it's written out in your book, it doesn't mean you're automatically going to fulfill everything that is written in that book. That book contains God's intention for every single person, but the fulfillment of your book is conditional to your agreement and obedience to God's will for your life. And that's why it's so important for you to find God's purpose for your life, because in order to fulfill your book, you have to first find out what is written in your book. And and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, um, this is just a one-off message, but if you do want to go deeper and you're really, you know, feel like you need to discover your purpose, I wrote an entire book on the subject. Uh, So I'm going to try and put 150 pages into 30 minutes today. Uh, But if you want to go deeper, uh, we have those available for you as well, because today I want to talk about clues to your purpose. You know, God doesn't always outright speak to us and just say, hey, this is what I've called you to do, but he does leave us clues. And if you follow those clues, they reveal what's written in your book and they'll ultimately lead you to your purpose purpose. And so the first one today I want to talk about is your passion. That the first clue is passion. Your passion points to your purpose. You know, I was talking with a, a, a young college student in our church, and she said, you know, I just want to know what God's will is for my life. And I said, okay, well, you know, what do you want to do? And she says, I just want to do whatever God wants me to do. And I said, okay, great. But like, like, what do you want to do? I just want to do God's will. Whatever his will is for my life, that's what I want to do. And I was like, okay, stop being spiritual. I know you're talking to your pastor, but like, just be real. Like, if you could do anything, if you could choose any career path you wanted, what would you choose? And she said, well, I really like, you know, um, helping people who are in crisis and giving them, you know, the tools that they need to experience mental and emotional freedom. And so, you know, I thought about being a counselor. I said, that's great. You know, go to college for counseling. Start taking some classes. And she goes, no, that's what I want to do. I asked you, what does God want me to do? And I can't tell you how many times I've had that exact same conversation with people. Uh, Dozens of times I've had the exact same conversation because many people have this mindset that there's God's will for my life and then there's what I want to do with my life and those things aren't anywhere close to each other. There's this mindset that what God's will is for my life is not going to be what I want want to do. And this was kind of the mindset that I grew up with. I thought God's will for my life was going to be something that I hated to do. So I was kind of afraid of finding God's will for my life. Like what if God wanted me to be a missionary and I never want to leave the country? You know, what if God wants you to be a teacher and you hate kids? What if God wants you to be a nurse and like the sight of blood, you know, you just like pass out, you know, it's like a bad combination. So, so, so what if you find out God's will for your life and you absolutely hate it? And I think this is secretly why many people are content not knowing God's will for their life so they can play the ignorance card. You know, God, I had no idea. That's what you wanted me to do. They'd rather be ignorant concerning God's will rather than find out what his will is and discover that it's something that you absolutely cannot stand. You know, when I was in uh, college in, in uh, Bible school, um, I was at a church, and at our church, we had a missionary from Siberia come to our church, and in Siberia, it gets to be negative 40 degrees, and he talked about doing an outdoor crusade. He didn't, you know, as soon as he got there, he did an outdoor crusade in the middle of the winter, negative 40 degrees, and people actually showed up and gave their lives to Jesus, and he's sharing all these amazing stories, and it's really cool, but after the service, I was talking to uh, my roommate, Kevin Miller, as you saw in the video, and I said, man, I would never want to be a missionary in Siberia. It is way too cold for that. And somebody overheard our conversation and they said, be careful. Don't say that. If God hears you say that, he's going to send you there. (laughs) Come on. How many of you heard something like that growing up? Like, yeah, 
Yeah, don't say you don't want to do something because God will make you do it as if God is some cosmic stepbrother who just wants to make your life miserable. I had a stepbrother growing up who loved to make my life miserable. Like, like he didn't just like torture me in the way that, you know, big brothers can do sometimes. Like, no, he would like lie awake at night and invent new ways to torture me. He did this thing that he called the blue burrito. And so he'd put me in this blue sleeping bag that we had and he would hang me over the balcony of our two-story house. So that way, if I unzipped it, you know, I would just like plummet down to the ground. Uh, he uh, did this thing where he put me in a, in a cardboard box on the top of the stairs. And he's like, yeah, you're going to, you know, slide down. It's going to be like cool runnings. You know, it's going to be cool. And so I get in the box and, you know, when you put a box on the stairs, you push it down. It doesn't like slide down the stairs. It just flips. Yeah, exactly. One end over the other until I hit the bottom. Uh, one night I, I, I went to bed early because I had a, a, something that really important the next morning that was super early in the morning. And while I was asleep, he painted my fingernails and put makeup on my face uh, before, you know, my big day. So he just lived to make my life miserable. And that's what many people think God is like, that he's some cosmic stepbrother who wants to torture you. Um, and, and so if he hears you say something that like, oh, I would never want to do that. He's like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send them there. I'm going to make them do the thing that they least want to do in this world. But that's not actually what the scriptures teach. It says this in Philippians 2.13, for it is God's power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So this says that God is at work in you, giving you the desire to do his will. So before God calls you to do something, he first gives you the desire to do that thing. I was talking with a young man and he said that, you know, he wanted to be a teacher because, you know, uh, when he was in school, his home life was very rough. And so his teacher just had a profound impact on his life and shaping him into uh, uh, the man that he is today. And he wants to have that same impact in the lives of others. But he says, I just don't know if that's what, you know, God wants me to do. I'm like, well, where do you think that desire came from? It's not the devil who's like, go make a difference in the lives of people, you know, uh, impact, you know, youth who don't have stable home lives. You know, no, like that, that desire is obviously from God. Your, your desires, your dreams are not insignificant. They are one of the clearest indicators of God's purpose for your life. And so one of the primary uh, uh, clues that God has given us for his purpose for our lives is our passion. Number two, gifts. Your gifts point to your purpose. See, just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean that it's your purpose because you can be passionate about something you're not gifted to do. And everybody who's watched the first round of American Idol knows exactly what I'm talking about. You can be passionate about something that you have no gift to do, right? Those people are passionate about singing, right? They, they know that's why they were put on this earth to, to sing, to be the next American idol. And then they open up their mouth and you're like, nope, you are not it, right? That is not your purpose in life. And, and I never blame the people who try out on the show. I, I blame their family and friends. <laughs> At some point, somebody should have sat them down and said, <laughs> You don't have the gift. This is, we need to find a different path for you. Like what friend, what mom, what dad just lied to them and led them on to the point where they went on national television to embarrass themselves. See, but if God has called you to do something, he's going to give you the, the gifting that matches the calling, right? God gives you the gifts that you need to accomplish your purpose, which means if you're not gifted to do it, you're not called to it. Spiritual gifts are the tools that God has given us to accomplish the task that he has put before us. And so if you find yourself trying to accomplish a job that you're not gifted, you're not wired to do, there's a good chance that God has not called you to do that thing. You know, there are some people who are naturally gifted singers and there are some who aren't. You know, and even if you're naturally gifted, you might still have to do like voice lessons and work to hone that craft and develop that gift. But there's gonna be a natural gift to work with. And so if you feel like God has called you to be a worship leader, you're going to have to have a natural gifting to go with that calling, which means if you can't sing, God has not called you to be a worship leader. Now, I know we've all been to churches that didn't get that memo, <laughs> right? They just let anybody on that stage because they have a good heart. Unfortunately, when you're singing into a microphone, we don't hear your good heart. We hear your bad voice. So I'm like, oh, that's mean, but they just love God so much. That's great. You can love God on the front row. 
you, you ain't got to love God on this stage. The best thing you could do that for that person is help them find a place where they can use the gifts that God has given them because this ain't one of them. If you're not gifted to do it, you're not called to it. God gives gifts to match your calling. And so one of the ways you can discover God's purpose for your life is by identifying the gifts that God has given you. You know, some of you are administrative. You're, you're detailed and meticulous. You can bring order to chaotic situations. You could plan events with a lot of different moving parts with relative ease. That's a gift. Not everybody can do that. Uh, some people have the gift of giving. It's a spiritual gift that's mentioned in Romans chapter 12. Now, we're all called to give to support the work of the Lord, but there's some people who have the gift of giving, that their primary contribution to the kingdom of God is building successful business, making a lot of money, and giving to support kingdom causes. There are others who have the gift of compassion. In First Corinthians, uh, sorry, in Romans 12, it's called uh, the, the mercy gift. There are just some people who are drawn to people who are hurting. When people are in crisis, they're the first ones to show up, to lend emotional support, to clean their home, to provide pr practical care for people when they're going through difficult circumstances. And, and some of you, you don't really think it's a gift because it, it's always come naturally to you. When, when that stuff happens, you know exactly how to respond. You don't need to be told what to do. You just do it. That's how you know it's a gift. Not everybody is wired that way. Some people have to be told, hey, so-and-so is going through a hard time. Call and check on them. Show up at their house. Bring them a meal. You know, pray for them. Like, reach out to them. See how they're doing because they're, they're not wired that way. Others have the gift of encouragement. They're, they're positive, uplifting. They affirm people with their words. They see the best in every situation. That's a gift. I have the opposite of that gift. I see the worst in every situation. I have the gift of criticism. Uh, it's not mentioned in the Bible, but I believe I have that gift because I constantly pick every single thing apart all of the time. So if you have the gift of encouragement, don't minimize that gift. And see, when it comes to the gifts that we have, we kind of sell them short while we tend to elevate the gifts that other people have. And some of you are, are, are great at giving people advice. You know, people are always bringing their problems to you and you give them sound counsel and it just kind of happens naturally to you. It's kind of effortless. It just kind of flows out of your life and it doesn't require a whole lot of work, you know? It just kind of flows out of your life naturally so you, you won't really think of it as a gift, but it is. I wish I had that gift. People think I have that gift because I'm a pastor, so I'm supposed to be great at counseling people and giving them advice, but I'm actually terrible at it. And I, I've talked about this over the years and, you know, joked about it, and there was a guy in our church who thought I was just kind of being humble, you know, which I don't do. Um, so, and so he thought I was just being humble by saying I'm terrible at counseling, and so he came to me uh, with the problem that he was going through in his life, and he's like, what do I do? I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, you got no advice for me at all? I said, I got nothing. Please let me know how this situation turns out because I don't have a clue how this thing is gonna go. And he goes, man, you really are terrible at this. It's like, I know, this was not false humility. I really am genuinely terrible at giving people advice and counsel. It's not a gift that God has given me, but some people have that gift. There's also a gift of helps. There are people who don't want to do anything on the stage. They are content to work behind the scenes. They don't need to be seen. They don't need to be recognized. They don't desire a platform. They don't want to be in the spotlight. They just want to work behind the scenes to make things happen. But most people who have the gift of helps don't really think of it as a spiritual gift. But it is, in fact, a spiritual gift. It's actually mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a chapter that's all about spiritual gifts. And it says this, but God chose some people to be apostles and prophets and teachers for the church, but he also chose some to work miracles or to heal the sick or help others or be leaders or speak different kinds of languages. Notice the gift of helps is mentioned right in between the gift of healing and the gift of leadership. But many people who have this gift, they don't think that their gift is special because it's not spectacular, like you know, healing or leadership. Obviously, if you are working miracles and praying for people, that's a pretty spectacular gift. If, if you're you know, a, a leadership you know, guru, right? if you're an amazing leader, right? it's gonna, it's gonna you know, bring you before people. It's gonna give you influence with other people. And so people tend to look at you know, the miracle workers and the people who have the great leadership gift, but helps is a gift. In fact, if, if our church 
or growth, if it was built on people who had the gift of healing and people who had the gift of leadership, we'd still be on Archwood Drive and we wouldn't be here where we are today because our church is built on the backs of people who have the gift of helps. Now, it's, it's built on these people. If it was all leaders, our church would be really in trouble on a Sunday because leaders don't wanna do nothing. Every person that's got a gift of leadership that has a degree in leadership management, they are the most useless people in our church. We're like, hey, can you greet somebody? Can you pick up trash? They're like, no, I just, I wanna tell other people what they need to be doing better, but I don't wanna do it. They're all experts in critiquing and telling other people how to lead, but they don't lead anything themselves. So if we were dependent on leadership gifts, we'd be in trouble. But thankfully, our church is where we're at today because people who have the gift of helps, who say, I don't care if anybody sees or recognizes my contribution, I'm just here to help out and to do my part. Their contribution to this church cannot be calculated. But there's, that's a gift of the Spirit. In fact, the New Testament mentions over 20 different gifts, like the ones that I just mentioned. I don't believe it's an exhaustive list, but I think it shows the wide variety of gifts that God gives to people. And if you don't know your spiritual gift, uh, we want you to come to our Discover class. Uh, Discover is designed to do that very thing, is to help you discover the gifts that God has given you. We do a personality profile and a spiritual gift assessment so that you can figure out how God has wired you and the gifts that he has given you. Because the, the the desire, the heartbeat of our church is not just to have a bunch of people come and listen to a message on a Sunday, but to get every person operating and using the gifts that God has given them to make a difference in the lives of others. And so if you haven't been through this class, it's happening next Sunday, step one at our 12 o'clock service in the classroom directly across from our cafe. But we would love to have you here for that. And so there's giftings that God has given you, but then there are also talents, skills, and abilities that you've develop throughout the course of your life. You know, we do a, a, a medical missions trip where we take people who are nurses and doctors who've, uh, 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 you know, spent years acquiring uh, knowledge and expertise in this area so that they can use it to make a difference in the lives of, of those who don't have access to adequate medical care. And so uh, there are, are so many different things that we could just talk all day about this, but God doesn't waste any ability. He matches your calling with your capability. So your gifts, your talents, the skills, uh, the, the things, the knowledge that you possess, that you have accumulated over the course of your life, all of those things point to God's purpose for your life. And then number three, your place. So once you've discovered your passion, your gifts, the next step is to identify the place that God wants you to, to focus your passion and your gifts. You know, there was a pastor who, uh, older pastor, he passed away and he went to be with the Lord and he's standing at the, the gates of heaven getting ready to receive his reward from God. And just behind him, there was an Uber driver who had just passed away from a reckless driving accident uh, seconds after he got there. And so the, the pastor goes first and God says, because of your years of faithfulness and dedication to the church, here is a small studio apartment where you can spend all of eternity. And then God goes to the Uber driver and says, for your two years of being an Uber driver, here is a giant mansion on a lake. And the pastor said, what? This is not fair. I dedicated my life to the work of the ministry and this guy, he gets rewarded for this and he's only been an Uber driver for two years? And God said, yeah, while you were preaching, half the audience was asleep, the other half were on their phones. When this man was driving, everybody was praying. <laughs> See, you can make a difference operating in your gift outside the church just as much, if not more so, than a pastor operating in his gift inside of the church. Unfortunately, many people think that unless they're called into full-time vocational ministry where they work in a church, that it doesn't really matter what they do. They don't really have a calling. They don't really have a purpose. And it's that idea is primarily perpetuated by pastors because the only time we talk about people being called, it's always in the context of being called into ministry, which causes people to think that unless they're called into ministry, they're not really called anywhere. So it doesn't matter what they do unless they go to church and pay their tithes. But that's just not true. You know, out of the, the 12 tribes of Israel, only one tribe was called into full-time ministry, the tribe of Levi. The other 11 were called into a, a different sphere of influence, a different uh, aspect of society that, that they gained mastery in and that they were skilled 
in. And so God calls people into ministry, yes, but he also calls people into other uh, areas in arenas of society. And so it, it, it's great that you serve in, in kids ministry and you work in hospitality and you're on the worship team on Sundays, but where are you the rest of the week? Because no matter what your occupation or vocation is, God wants you to bring the kingdom of God into your sphere of influence. God intentionally places believers into all these different aspects of society so that they can be salt and light wherever they are. That every Christian is called to be a minister. The word minister simply means servant. And so we are all called to be servants. We're all called to full-time ministry. It's just that some do it in the church and some do it primarily outside of the church. In Ephesians chapter four, it talks about the fivefold ministry gifts, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Their job, their function, their role is not to do the work of the ministry. Their job is to equip God's people to do the work of the ministry, is to equip people to do what God has called them to do. So you can say it like this. The purpose of ministry inside the church is to prepare people for ministry outside of the church. And so my job as a pastor isn't to change the world, it's to pastor world changers. My job isn't to influence this community, it's to influence the people who are going out on Monday into every arena of this community. My job is to instill biblical values into people so they're not corrupted by the world as they seek to change it. Right, the goal of ministry in the church is to prepare people to go into their mission field. So if you work in fashion, you are a missionary to the fashion world. If you work in government, you are a missionary in the political arena. If you are in business, you are an ambassador for the kingdom of God in business. If you work in education, you are to be salt and light in your schools. Like all through the scripture, we see God using people to change history, to change culture in society, but they didn't do it in a religious context. Joseph used his understanding of business and economics to save two nations during a famine, right? Daniel wasn't a prophet. He was uh, a politician. He worked in an administration, in, in a very wicked and evil administration at that, but yet he walked with integrity, wisdom, and excellence. And so he was used by God to influence politicians and establish the kingdom of God in Babylon. Nehemiah used his connections to raise money and to get people to head back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls after they'd been torn down during exile. All through the Old Testament, so many of these heroes, they're not just prophets, but they were ordinary men and women who were used by God in their sphere of influence to change culture. They were politicians, judges, soldiers, mothers, fathers, and business leaders who operated in the sphere of authority that God had called him into and made a difference that impacted people and entire nations. See, just as much as God calls people into full-time vocational ministry, he calls others into education, entertainment, business, media, government, and family. Everyone has been given a sphere of society that God has called them to influence and bless. And part of finding God's purpose for your life is finding the place where he wants you to pour your gifts, your energy, your talents, and your passion. In fact, I believe that you will only be as fruitful, as successful, and as fulfilled to the degree to which you find the place that God has called you to use your gifts. You know, I've, my gift is teaching. That's my gift. And uh, I, I've always actually wanted to be a teacher. I was actually going to school to be a, a PE teacher. Uh, so I guess not really a teacher. I wanted to play dodgeball um, for the rest of my life. And um, that was the only place where I could fulfill my calling of full-time dodgeball player. But I was gonna be a teacher. And so that was my goal. And I was, you know, you know uh, pursuing, you know, that particular career field and, and God uh, through a number of different ways, which, you know, we, we share uh, in this book and stuff like that. God led me into uh, full-time ministry. And so I'm using my gift to teach you know, God's word. And so I, I don't believe that I would have been equally as fulfilled if I was, you know, teaching PE or history as I am teaching 
God's word. I don't believe that I would have the impact that God created me to have until I found the place where he wanted me to, to use the gifts that he had given me. And so mine are ministry, but yours might be somewhere else. And so part of your purpose isn't just finding your passion, it's not just finding your gifting, but finding the unique place that God wants you to fulfill your calling. And it's amazing how so many Christians, that they, they, they always want to have a job at the church. They always wanna have a role in the church, but God is trying to get people out of the building and into the four corners of society. He's trying to get you, uh, he's called you into the realm of, of business. And I, I believe that, that specifically in this service, there are, are, are business men and women who uh, are making a ton of money and they feel guilty because of how much money they have. And they're like, man, I feel like I'm not where God wants me to be. I'm successful, I'm doing all these things. But it's because God wants you to connect kingdom purpose to the business gift that he's put on your life. You shouldn't feel guilty about making a bunch of money. You just have to say, God, where do you want me to funnel this? Allow me to be a pipe so I can funnel the resources that you have given me into the people and the places that need it the most. Because guess what? If you're a pipe, guess what happens? If water's flowing through a pipe, guess what? That pipe is getting wet. And if God can flow resources to you and through you, you're gonna be blessed by it as well. But there are people that God has anointed for business. You have a mind for those things. There's engineers in here that God wants you to solve problems that people are facing. There's people here who are are going into uh, the counseling uh, field. And so where people are just being medicated, God wants to give you supernatural solutions to the things that people are facing and experiencing that don't involve drugs that have side effects such as suicide. It's like, you know, hey, I'll stick with this depression if the side effect is suicide, you know? It's like, it's like come, there's gotta be a better way. And that's why he's put you in every sphere of society to bring uh, real solutions to practical problems, to use you to be salt and light in your place of work, in your career field to bring change. And it's only as we we, uh, accept that call and that mandate to do that, that we will fulfill uh, God's purpose for our lives, for our city, and for this region. Amen? Amen. If you guys would, bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that right now. I mean, God created you for a plan, a purpose, and for a destiny. But there's a thing called sin that ruined and ruins, continues to ruin God's plan and purpose for our lives. And so that's why God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for our sins, was buried, and three days later, he rose again so that by believing in him, we could be forgiven. We could enter into a relationship with God here and now. We could have the hope of heaven when this life is over, and we can actually step into the purpose that God created for us. And it all starts by making the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today and you are ready to make that decision, I mean, I'd love to pray for you right where you're at, in your seat. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you're here today and you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus, you're ready to receive his forgiveness and his grace, will you just slip your hand up in the air? I just wanna pray for you today. I just wanna know who I'm praying for today. Just slip that hand up in the air. Say, Josh, include me in that prayer. Just slip your hand up in the air. Thank you, you can put your hand right back down. Let's all pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose again. Come into my life. Forgive me and make me new. I choose to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together for those who made decisions to follow Jesus? If you...